thousand years had come and gone, yet only darkness never dawned. They wait in expectation. They know that God had vowed to come, Messiah Christ, God's only Son. Grace and kindness. We are saved from sin and death. No fear now, but our last breath. You gave us salvation. We, your children, come to praise. Take the glory of your name. Together we sing. Good morning, would you stand and sing with us this morning? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, no perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the songs of this life, I won't turn
I was told to give the announcements for this week, and the announcements for this week is none. So I'm going to give you two, I'm going to give you three, I'm going to give you two for next week, and one kind of a general announcement that applies for all men Saturday mornings. When you wake up in the morning on Saturday morning, fellas, and you can't think of anything else to do, we're still working over here. That's just a given. So if you have a free Saturday and want to come and help, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, it's making an old man out of me, and, and so I would appreciate it too. Uh, the announcements for next week uh, on the 6th, there's going to be a, a brag raw. This sounds like a Chitwood Brian thing. Brian made it up. Uh, yeah, there it is right there. Brian made this up. It's a brag raw, and in, and in case you uh, don't know what that is, it's in the church paper, but it's going to be a bike ride for the youth in Grinnell, and he wants you to meet here at 6. If you need a bike, let him know, let Brady know, or let Derek know. So that sounds like a good time for the youth. And then on the Thursday, on the 7th, at 7 o'clock, the CCD, CCW ladies are going to meet, uh, and that's probably to be determined yet. But uh, those are a couple announcements for next week. Is there any other announcements that I do not know about? Jeanette? Next Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, if any of you are getting up and having your breakfast or whatever at 8, Channel 48 has a minister on there named Dale Morrison, and he's going to be talking about the Bible and what foods we should eat for our health and wellness and healing. So I just thought I'd throw that out there, but I don't want them to replace that with coming here for church. So they have to watch that at 8, then do Bible here at 9, and then church at 10. Okay, and if you can't make that at 8 o'clock, ask my wife. She has all those answers already. At least she tells me she does. <laughs> we'll turn it over to Roy or Randy. Good morning. As we come to our prayer time this morning, there's a list there in the, the bulletin. Uh, I have an update on Reed Wagner. Uh, he's, he was in Rochester, but now he's in Illinois, right across the river at a care facility for 20 days to gain strength. They took out the pick line and hope that he has gained, I think, 10 pounds, you said, and hopefully, roughly 10 pounds, and hopefully he continues to, to gain some strength. He had gotten uh, pretty weak, so keep him in prayer, and they're going to reevaluate at the end of the 20 days to see where, where he needs to be. Um, as far as uh, the rest of them on the list, is, I don't know anything about the Urban Plunge as far as how it's going. Is anybody with kids there get an update from them? Have you not heard anything from him? <laughs> Must be going all right then. Yeah, they get back sometimes today, but I didn't know when. I suppose it depends on how fast the bus goes. <laughs> uh, and I didn't hear that they didn't make it there, so evidently it got them there. Uh, any other prayer requests from, from you guys? Uh, I think most of the rest of them in there are, are pretty normal ones, so... Um, We'll go ahead and go to God in prayer then. Almighty God, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day to be in your house to worship you. We ask that you're with our Urban Plunge group as they finish up the day and head back, and I pray that they had a, a great time, learned a lot, and, and were a blessing to those who they met along the way. We do ask that you're with the rest of them on our, on our list here and, and give them healing when needed and strength and encouragement. Um, I realize there's a lot of people traveling now on vacations and getting ready to, to finish up and go back to school. So we ask that you're with those who are traveling and bless them, keep them safe. I ask that you're with Brady today as you bring us a message. Thank you for everything you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we're going to sing our communion song now. And um, I know everybody has sang this probably a million times, this song, but it is just powerful to think about. Um, Christ's sacrifice for us and the fact that he poured out his blood for us. Um, so would you just remember that as we sing this song?
Have you ever been sacrificed? Uh, most of you probably know my background, but in case you don't, uh, I was a PK. I was the preacher's kid here at Madison. And uh, we moved here in 65. In the year of 66, I got to spread my wings and not sit by my mother anymore. And so I landed in the back pew in the back. And I happened to be sitting in a chair that's kind of hid by those doors back there. And so my father, as he was speaking, could not see me. But he could see the two beside me. And they were having a good time. So his assumption was, I was too. And so he sacrificed me that day. I have never forgotten it. It left an impression on me. He stopped in the middle of his sermon and asked me to come to the front. Now that's really not a sacrifice. It's probably more of an example. A humili... Thank you. Just wasn't there, I couldn't say it. Uh, but at the time, I felt like I'd been sacrificed. Because actually, believe it or not, I wasn't acting up. I might have been enjoying those that were, <laughs> but, but I was really not a part of it. But he couldn't see that. And so he made a, de a decision for me. There's so many times in life we think we've had it pretty tough, maybe been sacrificed in one way or another, and yet there's really only one true sacrifice. And in Romans 8, 3, it says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have, and in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. If you look in the Old Testament, you see sacrifice a lot. In fact, if you look in the Bible and go clear back to the beginning in Genesis, Cain and Abel sacrificed to God. So sacrificing is something that God likes, God wants. If we were still in the Old Testament times and had uh, converted to the Judaism, we would be offering sacrifices yesterday in the temple, so to speak. But because Jesus has come, because God has made a plan, and that plan was to realize that when he created us, he knew that we were not going to be able to uh, be perfect like he wants us to be, and so he knew he was going to have to sacrifice his son, and he did so. And Paul talks about that in Romans. We can sacrifice, though, in a different way in our lives. In Ephesians 5.2, it says, life, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. But he... In, Paul to the church at Ephesus is saying, live a life filled with love. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes that's a little tough. Some people just aren't lovable. And yet, that is what we're to do. Uh, realizing that our sins have been forgiven by Christ's sacrifice for us. And then John, uh, 1 John 2.2, 2, he said in this scripture, he himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Today isn't just about for us. It's for everybody. And sometimes we like to forget that. We like to think we're in an exclusively little club. But he has been sacrificed for anyone and everyone in the world if they so desire to follow him and his word. So as we gather around the table, the table today and partake of these emblems, let's remember the sacrifice that Christ has made for us and let's be uh, doers of what he has instructed us in Ephesians and be lovers of those around us. Our Father in heaven, I'm so thankful, Lord, for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace. But I'm especially thankful, Lord, for your son Jesus, his willingness to come to earth 
not because he had to, but because he wanted to, to be the ultimate sacrifice for us in our lives, that we uh, can be cleansed of our sins, that we can have the hope of eternal life with you. We thank the Lord for these emblems that represent his broken body and his shed blood. Be with us as we partake of those and remember his suffering. In your son's name I pray, amen.
If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 1 today. And one thing, when you look at not just Isaiah, but any of the prophets, um, it helps to be familiar with God's law. Uh, what's written in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Because uh, we will see uh, what the prophets do is they're calling people back to the covenant. They're calling people back to God, calling them back to righteous living before God. So we'll spend time in Isaiah, but we'll also revert back to Deuteronomy as well. So here's what Isaiah says. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Okay. We can go back to 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, and we could read about uh, those times. But we'll do, we might do that a little bit. But here's what uh, Isaiah said. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Well, those are some pretty harsh words. And just to give a little more background uh, as far as the timing, okay, right now we have two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, during the king Ahaz's reign, um, Israel was taken into exile by the nation of Assyria. Um, and Judah had, to, Judah had some problems with, her, with Assyria as well. Um, so that's a little bit of the timing of this. But let's, let's go back through this. In verse 3, he says, Israel does not know. My people do not understand. That's pretty sad because God chose the nation of Israel. He chose a certain group of people to reveal his law to. And they were the only ones that knew it. And yet, they didn't understand. They were the ones that should have understood. And he said they had forsaken him. Not only did they forsake him, but they despised him. They hated God. What is the heart of the law? What did Jesus say is the greatest commandment? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart, soul, and might. But they have despised him. And there's a consequence of hating God. In Deuteronomy 7, 9 through 10, it says this. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. It's not a good outcome for hating God. And then Isaiah talks about this body that is sick, the whole body, okay, from head to toe. It's not, it's not very well. Well, it talks about that in Deuteronomy 28, under the curses for a lack of obedience. It says this, verse 22 of Deuteronomy 28, The Lord will strike you with wasting disease and with fever, inflammation and fiery heat, and with drought and with blight and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. Verse 27, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. 35, the Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. Isaiah said the same thing. On to verse 58, if you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, 
that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions, afflictions severe and lasting, and sicknesses grievous and lasting. And he will bring upon you again all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness also and every affliction that is not recorded in the book of this law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. Okay. It says they did not understand, but if they looked at the law, they should have understood because it was all right there. Isaiah is calling them back to the law. Okay, So there's a body that is just completely sick from head to toe. Verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Foreigners devour your land. Okay, uh, Judah, if we read the accounts in 2 Kings and Chronicles, uh, we ha- they had to deal with the, nation of, with the nation of Syria and Assyria, okay, two different nations. They had to deal with Israel a little bit for a time, and they had to deal with um, Edom, the Edomites, and the Philistines, okay? They would devour their land and take, take over cities. But here's what it says in Deuteronomy 28. Uh, verse 29, and you, shall be open, and, and you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall ravish her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat any of it. Your donkey shall be seized before your face, but you shall not be restored to it. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, but there shall be no one to help you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day long, but you shall be helpless. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and all of your labors, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually, so that you are driven mad by the sights that your eyes see. Skipping ahead to verse 49 of 28. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It shall eat the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of your ground until you are destroyed. It also shall not leave you grain, wine, or oil, the increase of your herds or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish. They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. It's not good. It's not good to forsake God for the people of Judah. But they should have known that because they should have paid attention to the law. So they're left like a besieged city. And then it's like he really insults them in verse 9, even more so in verse 10. Because he said, If the Lord of hosts has not left us a few survivors... We should have become like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. And there's a verse in Deuteronomy that says, you'll be few in number if you do not obey. Um, So when you read that verse, you think, well, at least we're not as bad as them. But then when you get to verse 10, it says this. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So he calls out the rulers and the people, okay? The rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah. Well, um, we all seem to just, you know, it's easy to just say Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, it was just uh, complete sexual immorality, homosexuality, that's why God destroyed them. Well, uh, Jude says that in the New Testament, okay? They had unnatural desire. Um, but in Ezekiel, um, which is a sad chapter because... Ezekiel is, is talking about how um, Judah was worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. In Ezekiel 16, it says this of Sodom. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Okay. So, They're on the same level as Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus even talks uh, of certain cities. He talks about on the day of judgment that it will be worse for some of the cities in his day uh, than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah, which that's that's pretty bad, okay? 
So the rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah. Let's go on in verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. God didn't need another sacrifice. He didn't want them to to keep bringing sacrifices. What he wanted was obedience. God wants obedience. And so for us today, uh, because we can do the same thing, uh, we can come to church thinking that, you know what, that's enough. God's happy that I'm here. What is that? God wants an obedience in our lives. We can't think that we can just pay him off with sacrifices like Judah did. Okay? They thought God would just be satisfied with those, but God wants obedience. The other thing those verses tell me is that there's absolutely no fear of God. There is no fear of God among the people. God hates iniquity in the solemn assembly. So when we come to meet together, do we, do we have a fear of God? And not just here, but throughout our lives. I mean, in communion, do we, do we focus on what actually happened? Do we take it seriously? Do we have a fear of God? Because they didn't. He says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. I'm not saying this is true all the time, but you ever not had your prayers answered? You ever felt like maybe God's not listening? Well, maybe he's trying to tell you that there's some sin that needs to be dealt with. I don't know, just saying, because it says it there. Okay, verse 16. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. It's a lot of stuff there. First of all, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. In Exodus 30, okay, before a priest would minister uh, at the temple, okay, he had to go through a process of washing. He was to wash his hands and feet and become clean before he ministered before the Lord. Okay, God says, remove the evil of your deeds. I want obedience. Learn to do good. Cease your evil. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. We have some widows in our congregation, and all I can say is that I hope we have pled your cause enough. Because um, that's something that God does. God says that in the law in Deuteronomy. Um, let me find it. In Deuteronomy 10, it says this. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. Okay? That is something that God does, and we should take it seriously. And that is, that is echoed in the New Testament as well. And if, if it's not taken seriously, then that's something that has to change. All right, back to Isaiah. And Isaiah wasn't, Isaiah wasn't the only one that talked like this. Uh, the prophet Micah, uh, who prophesied in the same days as Isaiah, said the same thing. And Micah 6, 6 through 8, said this, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Okay? God wants justice. He wants those who are most vulnerable to be cared for and looked after. Now, so far, it sounded pretty bad. Okay, God, God's serious about keeping the law. He wants obedience. And it's easy to think of God, well, actually, no. It's not easy if you, if you read it. Um, sometimes we just think that in the Old Testament, God is a God of wrath, but that, yes, he is, but he's also a God of forgiveness, and that is also in the Old Testament. Verse 18, he says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay? That's simple in the blessing and curses of the law. If you're willing and obedient, things are going to go well. But if not, okay, you're going to have trouble. But who else but God can take can take something that is scarlet, something that is red, and make it white as snow. Okay, um, that's, that's pretty hard to get out something that's stained red and make it pure white. Only God can do that and take away sin like that. Okay, verse 21. How the, un, how the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Okay, now Isaiah turns to the rulers of Sodom. Okay, it was full of justice, it was full of righteousness, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your silver is impure. It's lost its value. What good is wine mixed with water? Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. They love a bribe and run after gifts. That's not a whole lot different than the princes we have in our nation. There's a lot of money involved in politics. People get paid off. Uh, when they get voted in, they try to make things a certain way for those that have given them money. But this is what their princes were supposed to do from Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 16 it says, you shall, not, or excuse me, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God has given you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You, sh you shall not show partiality. You shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land the Lord your God is giving you. Okay. Justice was important. And not just for the judges of the land, but the king should have known this stuff as well. Because here's the instructions to the king from Deuteronomy 17. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. There's King Solomon right there. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it. He shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in, in Israel. If the kings actually had done that, made their own copy, spent time every day in God's law, they would have known that justice to the fatherless, justice to the widow, was an important thing to God. Uh, but here's an example of King King Ahaz uh, from 2 Chronicles. This is what it says of him in 2 Chronicles 28. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. 
He even made metal images for the Baals, and he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burned his sons as an offering, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Okay, the king, especially the king, um, but everybody was instructed uh, to know the law, but especially the king. Okay, every day he should have been in the law and known what was important. Okay, verse 24. Therefore, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and I will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her, those in her who repent by righteousness. God's willing to forgive. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. And the strong shall become tender, and his work a spark. And both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. We'll go back here in a little bit. But first I want to talk a little bit about 29. Where it says, You will be ashamed of the oaks that you desired and you shall blush uh, for the gardens that you have chosen. Um, I, don't, I don't know a whole lot about the worship that took place there. Um, some of it involved weird sexual practices with idolatry and everything. Um, but... It was something strictly forbidden, and we can see that in the law. It says this in Deuteronomy 12. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall... You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. Okay. Judah was supposed to destroy those places. Okay. That was strictly forbidden. And God says they'll, they'll be ashamed of that. But I want to go back to, um, to 25 and 27. It says, my hand, I, I'm turning my hand against you, and I will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your ally. What requires the smelting of silver? Fire and heat. To get out the impurities of the metal, it requires heat. An alloy is... Uh, two metals mixed together to make one. God wants to purify them. Okay, that requires fire. He says, Zion shall be redeemed by justice. It needs to be redeemed because God's courts have been trampled. Um, Jerusalem, <laughs> the, pe the people are not, they're not following God. They're not, um, they don't know the law. They're not following the law. But it says God will redeem them with justice. He's willing to forgive them, but it will be done with justice. When you think about the justice of God, it is not something that is weak. Um, it's a whole lot different probably than, than what we would think of justice. Because God's justice is always in full measure. And the people of Judah were going to bear that. Uh, this is what it says later on in Isaiah 27. Measure by measure, by exile, you contended with them. He removed them with his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces, 
No asherim or incense altars will remain standing. Then Jeremiah 30 says this, 10 through 11. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and and none shall make him afraid. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will make a full end of the nations among whom I scattered you. But of you I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure and will by no means leave you unpunished. Redemption comes at a price. And it's always a just price. Have you ever read um, Lamentations or the prophet Jeremiah? Um, Because that that just price that uh, God's people had to pay was was pretty harsh. Um, It even even talks about it in the law um, that that when that time would come. But the siege of Jerusalem was so bad, and you you can read about it uh, in Lamentations, uh, but it says that... uh, the people, people would even eat their own sons and daughters because that's how bad it was. But I suppose if you're, willing to, if you're willing to sacrifice your own child in the fire to some false god, what, what's the next step but to eat it in, in such a day of distress? So what I want to bring it to is this. What is the just price for our nation? (laughs) What is the just price for our nation? (sighs) Because we have blood on our hands. There's blood on the hands of our rulers. 60 million babies aborted since, since Roe v. Wade, at least that we know of. Um, sexual immorality. Uh, I, l- I was looking up statistics of pornography, and, I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, one, that, one that I found common was said 47% of Christians say it's a problem in the home. That's almost half. No wonder we have problems in our families. No wonder marriages are destroyed. No wonder we have divorce. And, and what, when, when pornography gets that bad, when you can do that um, by yourself in front of a screen, the natural log- logical step, which is becoming a problem, is human sex trafficking. The real thing is a whole lot better than just a screen. And that's a problem too. And then you think about the, per- the perversion of our entertainment. How, how, how love is portrayed as a sexual encounter. You know, it's not love without sex. How there's so many shows, whether it's a drama or a, a news type show, that they come up with all these scenarios on how, how somebody is murdered. Okay, it's like we're fascinated with it. Okay. I don't, I don't want to talk, you know, just, there's all types of sexual morality, not just homosexuality. What about the treatment, how we treat or elevate the treatment of animals and the environment over people? Okay, you can be fined for throwing a little piece of trash on the ground, but yeah, we can get away with murder of an unborn child. What about idolatry? Idolatry of the American dream. Keeping up with the Joneses, we've got to have this, we've got to have that to be satisfied. What about the idolatry of sports in our culture, the, the amount of money that's spent uh, come this fall, there'll be a lot of worship on Saturdays and Sundays. And then we're raising our kids. Uh, we put our kids in sports, which is fine, but it seems to, 
to dominate some of our families where we're just running around taking them to all these events and everything revolves around that. And we're more concerned about if they win or not than what the values and morals are that we're teaching them. And then there's our education system that denies God's existence, cannot acknowledge him as creator. If you do, you're denied tenure as a professor. Okay? Uh, even back in the spring at graduations, uh, some kids, they simply just thanked God for being with them throughout high school and, wh- and whatnot. Okay? They just thanked God or, or said thank you to Jesus in their graduation speech. And there was a fuss about that. Okay? So what is the just price for our nation? Because if you read on in Isaiah, all the nations around Judah had a day. Okay? So how are we any different? And here's I want to bring it back to you. Is what part do you have in any of that? Because if you do, then as Isaiah says, then wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Because your redemption was also done with justice. In Romans 3, and Isaiah testifies this in Isaiah 53, but Paul says this. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God that is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. God, I pray that we would wash ourselves from our sins. God, show us, show us our sin. Reveal it to us. Let us desire obedience. Desire obedience. Let us be clean before you. That you would take away our sins as scarlet and make us white as snow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.